Hi, I'm Rick Sullivans. Suppose we wanted to keep track of more than one or two values from our recent readings in our loop. Uh, in this loop, I'm reading from analog pin A4. That's our, uh, our photo cell. And I'd like to store, let's say to start off with, I'd like to store six different values in an array. So I'll make an array that's got six different positions in it, and I'll initialize them all to zero. I'll do my setup as usual and keep time as usual in our, uh, our blank starter. And then each time I go through the loop, I'm going to shuffle all the values in my array. So I'll start at i equals zero and I'll set location zero equal to whatever was in location one. And then location one to whatever was in location two and so on. So I'll basically move all of the array elements one up the list. That's not going to be very interesting with them all starting off as zero. But finally, the last array element, this is NPTS minus one, so that'll be array element five, the sixth spot in the array, I'm going to set equal to a new reading from analog read A4. Then I'm going to go and print out my whole array so we can see what's in it. And finally, I'm going to wait until I push the button uh, so that it doesn't just keep printing out and going through the loop over and over again. So that'll let me just step through the loop. So if I compile that, we get our banner and we get our first iteration through the loop. It went and it read one element and it plugged it into location five in the array. If I push the button, it goes and reads another element and puts it in location five having already put the one from location five into location four. It also put the zeros up here from one into zero, from two into one, from three into two, but we didn't see that happening. If I push the button again, things move up the list further. If I push the button again, and so on. So I can keep on filling up my array. Now I've filled up my array with all different values. I've got six different historical values. If I push the button again, the oldest value, the one from location zero, disappears, and I get a new value in location five. Likewise, if I push the button again, the same process happens. So I always have the six most recent values there. And I can set this number of points to any value that I want, depending on what size of history I want to keep. I'm only using six here. It's a really small number, but it's easy to see what's going on. But that might be a number like 128 or 256 or 512 so that you could calculate FFTs from your data. Now, if I go up to 512, this loop here that I go through every time I'm taking a new data point is going to have to shuffle 512 values all the way up the list. That's going to take some time. That could be quite wasteful. So maybe instead of shuffling all the values inside the array, maybe we can move and put the latest value at a different location in the array. So let's try that instead. This code here is doing essentially the same thing, still six points, still has an array with uh, all zeros to start off with, and it still has the timing stuff. But down here, it's got this static variable index, which starts at zero, and it's going to keep on going through and incrementing the index each time it goes through the loop. That way it'll go from 0 to 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5. And then we'd like it to go back to 0. And that's what this modulo operator is doing at line 28. It's pushing it back to 0. So let's watch and see what happens this time. Instead of doing all that shuffling around, we're just going to put a new value into whichever location in the array corresponds to the index. And we'll print out all the values in the array just as we did previously. Note that because index is a static variable, it remembers the value every time the loop function is called. So you can keep updating the index value and it doesn't get lost between calls to loop. So this time around, we start off with the first value going into zero. I push the button, and the next value goes into zero. No, 
the same value stayed in zero. The next value went to one because the index is now one. Press it again. And these values stay the same in locations zero and one, but the new value goes into location two and so on until I get up to location five. Now I've filled them all up, up to location five, and the index should go back to zero and fill in a value, a new value, at the zero position. And sure enough, it does. So each time we go round the loop, we're putting a different value into a different spot in the array, and we just need to keep, in, keep track of where in the array our index is pointing to know what is the latest value that we took. This is way faster. We just have to be smarter when we go to look at the array to put it in the right order. So finally, in this code, we've added some more features. We're still taking six points, and we're still putting it all in this analog array, but we'd like to know what time things happen too. So we'll keep this time array as well. Still have an index and the basic timing stuff. And we're going to put a new value into our array, the same as we did before. But at the same time, we're also going to save whatever the time was when we did it. We then go up in the index value and up the number of points. And finally, this time around, we're not going to print it out every time. We're just going to let it go around and keep gathering history. But if we happen to push the button, that's what we'll get if we uh, have a uh, pin 12 pulled to zero when we put, pulled to ground when we push the button. We're going to call this show history function to actually look at the whole timing and analog inputs. Uh, and we're going to have a history function that starts at the current index. That means it'll start with the oldest value and go up to the most recent. And let's see what that looks like. So there's our banner. I push the button. And I'm getting values starting at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 0. So this isn't in sync in terms of the index number, but it is in sync in terms of the timing. So that's good. I started at whatever the index value was, and I then went on all the way around the loop and back to the beginning at 0. Here's another example where when I pushed the button, the index value happened to be 4. And sure enough, the time is constantly increasing here. It went 4, 5, 0, 1, 2, 3 to give me an accurate list of the history. So I no longer have to do this shuffling. I've got my data values. And a couple of cool things here. One is I've got them at pretty much uh, uh, 10 millisecond intervals, about 100 times a second. So there's 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, 0 0.04, 0 0.05. I've had to do something there to get that timing to be just right. And that's something I'd want if I was uh, going to put the data into an FFT, which requires uniformly spaced data. And the way I'm achieving that is right up here, I'm setting the frequency that I want to take my data at, sampling frequency in hertz. And down here, when I get to the end of the uh, uh, loop function, I'm checking to see what time it is, and I'm waiting long enough to make sure that I wait at least that appropriate number of uh, microseconds for that frequency. And I've tuned it. This number four here seems to be what it takes to get around and back to the top of the loop to read the time now value. So I've got the value that I'd expect from the frequency minus four microseconds just to get things as close as I can manage it. So I push the button again and again I'm seeing I'm going around the loop and I'm going in uh, hundreds of a second or very close to hundreds of a second. This show history function that I called it just takes the two arrays as arguments and which index to start at and then it goes around the loop from i equals 0 to the number of points, but for what it's going to print out, it calculates this k value as i, so 0, plus the starting index. So if the starting index was, in this case, 5, then it would be 0 plus 5 
modulo 6 is 5, then it would be 1 plus 5 is 6, modulo 6 is 0, and that's how it's going around the loop as it, uh, as it does that printing. So now I've succeeded in keeping an array. I can access it sequentially to do any processing I need to do, and I don't have to do that wasteful shuffling of maybe 512 or even 1024 values every time I go around the loop. You can use this approach with arrays for times and analog inputs to collect data and, and keep track of history. They don't have to be raw analog inputs. They could be smooth values. They could be values that were converted into millivolts. But you can keep track of what's been happening over time within your loop function and make better decisions that way.